Hey, yo, artists and musicians. Who, us? Yeah, do you want your own vinyl records? Yeah, but I can't order a thousand of them. Or wait like a year to get them. Yeah, we're going on tour in two months. Check out our friends lathecuts.com. They'll make you vinyl singles in quantities as small as 50 copies in as quickly as three or four weeks. Get out of here. You heard me right. All their pricing is a la carte, and they can help you pick a package that fits your budget. Okay, who will we talk to about this? You need to email my buddy Mike. His address is lathecuts at yahoo.com. And if you mention low profile, you'll get a 10% overrun on your order. So if I order 50 records... Mike's going to send you 55. If I order 75, I guess you would get 82 and a half? Something like that. Remember, you got to mention low profile to get that deal, and it won't be around forever. What was that address again? That's lathecuts at yahoo.com. Custom made records in small quantities. Mention low profile to get a 10% overrun on your order. And emailing now. Hello. This is Henry from Hampshire Fries. Man is a Bastard and Gun Outfit. In Claremont, California. I listen to this show because it's non-mainstream, non-corporate, outside of industry. Support at Patreon forward slash Low Profile. Tell your friends about the show and visit lowprofilepodcast.com to hear more. Hey, thanks to Henry Barnes for that introduction. This is the season three finale of Low Profile with Mark Lee Morrison, the podcast that stands at least six feet away from popular music. I'm your ever-loving host, Mark Lee, and before we get to today's featured guest, I thought this would be a good chance to clue you in a little bit about what's in store for season four, which will be starting in early 2021. My wife is bringing a baby boy into our family pretty soon and I'm going to be taking a little time off from running this show so I can spend some more time with my family. So I'll be hosting a few episodes here and there, but for the first time on Low Profile, I'm going to have a few friends I trust take over the show for the most part. Regular listeners are going to hear some familiar voices, mostly musicians, flipping the script and assuming the hosting duties. And I'm really looking forward to participating as a listener and helping out on the production and editing stuff as needed. And no spoilers here, but there's a very intriguing buffet of artists on the menu, so definitely stay tuned. And speaking of intriguing artists, today's episode is on the band Lavender Country, who recorded the world's first gay-themed country album in Seattle back in 1973. Now back then, if you weren't part of the gay community, it was highly unlikely that you would be hip to this record. The group initially disbanded in 1976, and then Patrick Haggerty, the band's founder, committed himself to fathering his two children, all the while being a prominent voice in the gay rights movement, where he met his husband, J.B. This episode was recorded on location at their home in Bremerton, Washington. Engineer Miles and I drove up there from Olympia, as well as Jack Habegger, who helped co-host this episode. And Patrick invited his bandmate, Jack Moriarty, who plays multiple instruments in the current version of the band. They're even going to play you some songs, too, but first, here's a quick taste of their self-titled album. This song is called Come Out Singing. Waking up to say hip hip hooray, I'm glad I'm gay. Can't repress my happiness ever since I tried your way. Cause gay time nothing's just begun So come on, let's tumble in the hay The interview you're 
you're about to hear has been edited, but there's a lot more great stories than could fit in one episode, like how Patrick and JB met and their work with the ACT UP organization. If you want to hear the raw, unabridged conversation with Lavender Country, it's on lowprofilepodcast.com. All right, let's dig in. So is this just audio? Yeah, yeah. this is just audio. Oh, cool. But you look great. <laughs> I could have worn my fucking house coat, man. <laughs> he should have warned you. <laughs> You're hearing Patrick Haggerty of the band Lavender Country. They are legendary. They've had just sort of a renewal in their story in the last decade or so. We are also joined here by two people named Jack. One the of two. them is my esteemed co-host for the day. Hello. And one of them is a current member of the current iteration of Lavender Country. Jack number two. Hello. <laughs> um, so, Jack, can you tell me how you came to be involved with this project and uh, your history with Lavender Country? Yeah, uh, it's a pretty long history. I mean, um, I've been part of Lavender Country since I was 14, that's when the uh, revival of Lavender Country started, was about 2014. And uh, I've been playing music with Patrick since I was, for as long as I can remember, I was probably five or six, and he taught me how to play guitar. So uh, yeah, I've, I've known Patrick for the longest time. He's just a, a good family friend. And uh, when Lavender Country got picked up again, he was I was one of the first people he came to to uh, you know, asked to be involved. And uh, yeah, we've been running together for quite a while. Awesome. And Patrick, I understand that you have a fair amount of involvement with Lavender Country. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> um, I'm Patrick Haggerty, and I'm the lead singer songwriter for the original Lavender Country in 1973. And the most amazing part of the story is that I lived long enough to be sitting here. Um, I'm now 76 um, and still doing Lavender Country. Lavender Country was a flash in the pan in 1973 when we made it. And it lasted till about 1976. And then Gay Country was absurd in 1973, never mind Marxist gay country. Um, so I had a whole long life that didn't have anything to do with Lavender Country, um, mostly as a political activist, mm -hmm. like being a member of s several socialist parties m my whole life, um, like the anti-apartheid movement, like the coalition against the police precinct in Seattle in 1989, like running for office with three members of the Nation of Islam twice on a black gay unity platform, like uh, a lot of activism in uh, the gay movement. And um, I did a lot of work in the black community in the 80s. Um, and I'm a parent. I was busy raising two kids. Lavender Country was completely dead. When we made Lavender Country, there were a lot of radicals in the gay movement. But by 1978, the Democratic Party had taken over the gay movement. Wow. And Lavender Country was flatlined, as were most radicals. Um, all of us were radicals. Anybody who came out in 1969 had to be a radical. Um, th that was a given. And Democratic Party queers rose to the forefront and shoveled us to the sidelines. And you weren't looking for a candidate. You were just looking for justice in general. In, indeed. Um, yeah. <clears throat> when I ran for office with the folks from the Nation of Islam, I, I, we knew it was, we weren't going to win. Um, that wasn't the 
why we did it. We did it to make our point. But I had a whole complete, very full, very active, very rich, rewarding life while Lavender Country was dead. It was quite a surprise to me when Lavender Country came back to life. But it was, you guys were on the fringes to begin with because you had a limited reach as far as being socially acceptable in that era. Um, yeah, we we did have a, a limited reach. Um, we made, one of the beauties of Lavender Country was we knew it had no commercial value when we made it. And we knew nobody was going to buy it um, except us. And by us, I mean Stonewall activists. Where were you living at the time? when In Lavender Seattle. Country? Okay. I was in Seattle pretty much this whole time. There were three beauties to it that contributed to the Lavender Country story. One, why did I choose country? Well, I can give you all kinds of reasons why, you know, three chords in the truth and country music is the, is the genre that allows you to be, tell a story and be expressive and blah, blah, blah. That's all bullshit. The real truth is I didn't know how to play anything except country. So that's why I chose country, because I didn't know anything else. Did you listen to country regularly? Yeah, I grew up in up? country, you know, with Kitty Wells and Hank Williams and Patsy Klein and that whole crew. Mm. And that was, I am a country kid. I grew up on a tenant dairy farm with my mom and dad and Ten brothers and sisters in a three-room, three-bedroom house, and Cozy. we were poor, and we went barefoot, and blah blah blah. blah. Loretta and Dolly got nothing on me, nothing. All right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I I grew up that way, and um, lived in a redneck, rough logging town, and you know the full catastrophe of country. Um, so that's why I chose country. Because um, you were living it. You say it was all I knew, man. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing left but holes in your weary sexist role. that album stand out uh, up against other things of that era is the sort of like the prominence of that flourishing piano sound that uh, your pianist oh. had in there. <clears throat> Nobody was doing that in country music. It, it, it Stylistically more along the lines of like George Winston or something. You know, it wasn't honky tonk piano. It was like very expressive. Well, that that gets that get, that that gets me into Michael Carr. Um, Michael Carr didn't grow up country, but he was very working class. And um, Michael Carr was a a Jew, uh, a, a, and quite an activist Jew. And um, Michael also lived a very long life and was um, a radical activist. Politically, he was my comrade and yeah. still is. Um, Eve Morris was uh, an, a uh, an activist lesbian, very good vocalist. She played fiddle, but it was classical fiddle, and she'd never played country before. Right. So and it showed a little bit in the album mm -hmm. that she wasn't trained country fiddle. She had a she had a beautiful voice. You probably noticed. I have noticed. Yeah, yeah. She, she was really great.
quiero um, Eve was also a Jew uh, so there were two Jews in, in the Lavender Country conglomeration. Um, there are a lot of Jews in country music. Yeah, um, that's true. They have a, a, right? You, you probably know yourself. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the kinky Friedman tradition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the Jews have been very active in country music from, the, from the beginning. Hey, very the nice. Jews went to Alabama and learned how to do it. And, and there's a very rich deep connection there that a lot of people don't understand but um michael and eve were not the first jews in country music they might have been the first out queer jews in country music um and finally robert hammerstrom the lead guitar player mm. robert was not gay um he grew up in eastern Washington, way up in a town called Medellin Falls, which is a tiny little burg up on the Canadian border, near the Idaho border. His mother was a dance freak, and she drove him every weekend 100 miles one way to Spokane, to take dance lessons. And uh, before Robert Hammerstrom got into Lavender Country, he was a ballerina uh, for the San Francisco Ballet Company for wow. several years. So no, he wasn't, um, he wasn't gay, but his ballerina experience <laughs> <laughs> he got a pass. The guy gave him a pass, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And um, Robert Hammerstrom is still with me and um, plays guitar in Lavender Country now. And he produced your most recent album, right? Yes, yes. And he has a studio in his home. And um, our most recent album, Blackberry Rose, was recorded at Hammerstrom's house. So um, that's the story of of who who made Lavender Country. Me and Michael and Robert Hammerstrom and Eve. Um, you might have you might have n noticed that there's not a drum on the eleven original Lavender Country band, and there's not a bass either. You know, I barely noticed because it, you, you guys did the trick. Well, um, there's a reason that that there was there's not a bass and a drum in Lavender Country, uh, and the reason is I didn't know you're supposed to have a bass and a drum in a band. I didn't know that. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's a good reason. I just yeah. ran in, into three other people who happened to you know play music and said come on help me make this album but i didn't have any formal training and i didn't know what the hell i was doing and in a lot of ways it shows um but in a lot of ways it gives a charm to the album definitely it definitely gives it a charm now so how did it uh, turn into a record? Had you guys been performing um, for a while before you decided to make the record? Or did you make a record and decide to become performers? No, it was more organic than that. And the important thing about making Lavender Country was, and this is like critical, the community of Stonewall activists in Seattle made Lavender Country, produced Lavender Country, came up with the money to make Lavender Country, located the music musicians for me, and also the community helped write the songs in that I would go into the building where we were doing the gay movement and there'd be people sitting around and organizing and organizing and doing and i go well what should i write a song about you guys and they would tell me mm. right write a song about this write about write a song about being in the closet georgie pie write georgie a song pie. about institutionalized oppression of of homosexuals 
So the trilogy, write a song about, you know, working class and gay connections and back in the closet again and write a song about sexual alienation and stranger. I was fed the topics by the movement. They, the movement told me what to write about. Uh, about the Walt and Will trilogy, are, are those stories that uh, you gleaned from everything happening? Or were they, they are. True stories they there? are real stories. Okay. Walt and Will, the, the guy who got sent to the mental institution. Waltz and Will was soft and sweet The way he waltzed was to your feet For a psychiatrist to think was fit So they said, hey son, we think we should sneak you a slug A raw manhood, the state hospital's just the place to get one Now they call him up, we're sicky You guys, that was me. That was me. Am I on my trip to the mental institution? I went to Western State Hospital, branded as sick, um, in 1967. I was having a real hard time with it. I'd been kicked out of the Peace Corps for being gay. It was a that was a real heartbreak for me in a, many many ways, and uh, it threw me into a tailspin. And one thing led to another, and I ended up at Western State Hospital. That the, the, the wall saying well is me. Ta da! <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. It happened to me, and the uh, um, the story about the people in prison. That's a, that's a real story, and <clears throat> the the guy who got murdered the last that was more of, of a composite story about our conflicts with the police. Mm. Um, but many of us were murdered under similar circumstances, and of course, it's not so prevalent now, maybe, but at the time. Um, many gay men were murdered in sexually compromising situations, and I had more than one friend um, murdered in the early 70s. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> the reason that raw <laughs> the trilogy is so raw and real is because it's raw and real. Yeah. <laughs> People just hating what they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very rich and uh, sad um, part of our history, and still is mm -hmm. um, in a lot of places. So what kind of places was the band setting up uh, live we, in those days? We, play, we played almost exclusively gay liberation events. If there was a symposium for social workers or mental health workers mm. um, that maybe lasted a day long, then there'd be a Lavender Country show for that. Um, Lavender Country played the first gay pride in Seattle, in, in uh, the first officially approved gay pride. When was that? 1974. And the city of Seattle actually did bless our parade and gave it official sanction. And we had it at Seattle Center. 
and you know where there's 575 to 775,000 people who show up for gay pride now yeah well that year in 1974 when lavender country played for gay pride there were like 400 people and we were thrilled it was like oh my god there's that's a lot of gay people, people at gay pride <laughs> oh wow this is over the top we made it we made it yeah just to you know like put it in perspective sure and then lavender country played again at seattle center in 2014 2015 where there were like 750,000 people and we played in the same place <laughs> Did you guys ever play to the wrong crowd? Do you have like a worst show story? No. No? Uh, all the shows we were ever invited to play were in a, in a gay liberation context. Um, Lavender Country played maybe 20 shows before it died. Um, we ran out of, we did, we sold the records. We pressed a thousand and sold them. And then there were a lot of needs for money in, in the gay community at that time. And mm -hmm. repressing Lavender Country wasn't at the top of the priority. Sure. And we'd pretty much come to a, the end of our run. Did you hear any stories from people whose oh, yes. lives you touched? Uh, many. And most of them were very moving. Did you save any of them? Um, no, I don't have any of the letters, but I've had communication with people across the country. Um, you don't know how many times I've heard, I buy your, la your lavender country in 1976 and I was living in, you know, Podunk, Indiana. And you saved my life. You, man, you saved my life. I've heard life-saving stories. We, we saved the lives of a lot of kids. I mean, I was in St. Louis, and a young a trans person named Joss Barton came up to me after the, after the Lavender Country show. She said, I was going to kill myself tonight, but my friend talked me to come to a Lavender Country show before I did. And now I'm not going to kill myself. Yeah, yeah, just a few years ago. Wow. And it turned out Joss was a fabulous poet and a pretty good singer. So I said, well, Joss, if you're not going to kill yourself, you might as well do a Lavender Country show with me. <laughs> and... Uh, and we've done that a couple, two or three times. Wow. That's amazing. I guess this music is serving its purpose. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's sort of a form of evangelism in a way. Uh, it is. I, I had, yeah, I had a thought about that that I was thinking about. Uh, oh, yeah, please. Is that on, on both of your records, you have a lot of songs that are very biting and very political and very dark. But at the same time, you have lots of songs of joy, lots of happy songs and parodies. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the importance of joy as part of a movement of social change. Well, a lot of it comes from my Marxism. And the, the bottom line of, of that is you, you, can, you can't make a revolution on despair. You have to have hope. Well, that's one thing that we found that we found out in this recent election cycle, right? Sure. <laughs> Without hope, we never would have won this election. Imagine if Stacey Abrams had been filled with despair when she lost her race for governor in Georgia, but she wasn't. She was she was full of vinegar and pissed off anger and hope to turn things around. And she 
and her crew managed to register 100,000 new voters. And they won the election for Biden. That's what I'm talking about. You, you can't do social change if you're depressed. I'm yearning for blue skies and your big blue eyes of chips and John. You have to have hope in your heart. Um, but you have to sing about the guts too. You have to sing the pain and tell, tell the story of the oppression. Yeah, you don't want to withhold the truth. Right. You have to have hope in the face of, of the truth. So, and then just 40 years, Lavender Country is not a thought in your head anymore. Right, right. It wasn't. And, um, I, and when I was raising my children mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s and, uh, and 90s, um, I wasn't doing Lavender Country. Right. I was... Are you here, JB? Yes, dear. <laughs> I was with my husband for three years before he even knew I made Lavender Country. And we went over to one of my friend's house and my friend uh, said to JB, oh, did you know Patrick made an album? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's good to have something in your back pocket though, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it turned out to be. But it's just an expression of how dead Lavender Country was. Dead, dead, dead. And then I moved from Seattle, and I met a blues harmonica harp player from South Chicago, a blues guy. And we got together and um, formed a little band called Memory Lane Songs, and we started singing to old people in Kitsap County. We played for 14 years, 100 shows a year. We were very busy. Yeah. And I was um, thrilled after 40 years to be able to sing again. It was like, whoa, what an honor and privilege. <laughs> I finally am far enough away from Lavender Country and nobody knows that I made it. I can sing Hank Williams and Patsy Cline to these old people who love it. So that's what I was doing and somebody put Lavender Country on YouTube. And a music aficionado named uh, Jeremy Cargill went, oh my God, what is this? And he found an old used vinyl from 1973 <laughs> and realized what it was and realized its historical significance and took it to a label called Paradise of Bachelors. Sounds like a gay label, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my phone rang, and it was Brendan from Paradise of Bachelors. And he said, hi, I'm Brendan from Paradise of Bachelors, and we want to reissue Lavender Country. And I didn't believe a damn word that was coming out of his mouth. But I was like, on, on the one percent chance that this is real, I'll play along. And then Brendan said, well, we're going to send you an advance. And I went, oh, yeah, right. You know, the Virgin Mary is coming out of a cloud tomorrow, too, uh -huh. right? And I went out to the mailbox, and there was a $300 check there. And I took it to the credit union and I gave it to the woman who was working the window. And I said, 
this check's not probably not any good. And she came back to the desk and she had three $100 bills in her hand and she said, it cleared, the check is good. And is that when you knew? That's when I, <laughs> that's when I knew. In the parking lot of the credit union, I went, oh my God, somebody in the world actually thinks that Lavender Country is worth $300. Somebody actually thinks it's worth three hundred dollars. Lost my mind, man! I lost my mind. So at that point, you'd already been working with Jack here for a number of years, uh, right around the time of this this reissue. Mm -hmm. At what point did you realize? Well, I've got to bring him on board. Jack's a very special story. Hi, mom. <laughs> Jack's mom, Lori. <laughs> You can say hi. Hi. <laughs> hey. I met Jack in utero <laughs> when I met Lori, and she was pregnant with Jack. When Jack was about four, he was so cute. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> we have a video of this. Have you you've seen it? I've seen right? this video. Right? It's the on video. YouTube, unfortunately. No. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> We stood Jack on a chair so he could be eye level with me. And I played guitar and Jack sang Blue Moon of Kentucky. Oh, I and, love that song. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, it's a great song. Um, and he could hardly pronounce the words, but he could sing on key. <laughs> I've seen that video a lot of times. Uh -huh. oh, God. Isn't it just darling? <laughs> right? I guess that's one of the perils of being born in the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all like um, the, And um, then, um, then I taught Jack guitar for like a year and a half. I won't, Jack will never say this out loud because he's too modest, but I'll say it. He's a fucking prodigy, okay? And I went to Jack's parents and I said, I want Jack in Lavender Country, but we need to talk because there's this whole thing about kids and gays and child molesting and it's replete throughout the culture. And everybody, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people are still buying that shit. And people are gonna have things to say if there's a 12 year old in Latin country. So let's talk. And they said, oh, we know all that shit. We don't believe in that shit. You know we don't believe in that shit. We want Jack to have this opportunity. We want Jack in Lavender Country. We'd be honored. Oh, that wasn't too hard to sell then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear about this until later. I didn't know the conversation <laughs> went down. I wouldn't have understood the issue at all anyway. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. You were 12 years old. Um, but they w were insistent. Thank God. What a blessing that he is because... Jack, I need a bass player. Jack, I need a rhythm guitar player. Jack, 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 Jack. Every time I turn around, I'm screaming for Jack. So we got the right guy on the show with you here. Yeah. You know, the Jack and Patrick show. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> Not to mention drums. Yeah, so drums and Oh, I bass. forgot all about the drums. Again? <laughs> Usually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, again. You, Usually he plays... Usually he plays drums. Um, so I understand you're prepared to play some songs. We are. Excellent. What this, you... uh, this first song is called Weeping Willow. And it's a gay song. And it, um, gay men who aren't having sex with one another have a tendency to call one another girlfriend. And um, I had a lot of girlfriends. Um, in the Stonewall years. 
and one of them was named Bobby Campbell, and he was a real champion in the AIDS activism scene. And um, he died early on after contributing hugely to the anti-AIDS movement. And he was my best girlfriend. And he died in uh, 1983. <laughs> um, we w we'd have one fa affair after another, and crash and burn, and crash and burn, and then go out and, and, and have another affair. And it wouldn't work out either, and a crash and burn, a crash and burn. It's a very common theme in the gay world. Um, because men don't know how to love one another because nobody taught us. So that's what this song's about, Bobby Campbell pulling me out of the hole again after another crash and burn. And I can't even remember who this crash and burn was about or even remember his name, but I'll never forget Bobby Campbell. <laughs> so that's how that one goes. It's called Weeping Willow. And it's about pulling me out of the hole again. You drip in the light, a weep in the weather. You got that long face on, are you still crying in your pillow? Cause your man done up and gone. You haven't shaved in day, you look listless and depressed. Either sleeping or you're in a huff Staring at the wall and sitting on your duff Your eyes are puffy and your nose stuffed up Girlfriend, you're just a mess Did he throw you for a loop-de-loop? -loop? Did he take you for a ride? Hit the land and skin the hide right off Your girl and go backside Lies that twirl you higher Than a kite without a line Did it hit you like a hammer When the glamour turned to flim-flam And the glitter turned to bitter chips of valentine Oh, did it hit you like a hammer When the glamour turned Bitter chips of Valentine. And like a weeping willow Don't you think it's time you quit this silly ball Like a newborn longhorn calf without a tit You've been zonked out long enough Have one good cry and then Let's go chase us up some men Aw, oh, come on now You're either sleeping or you're in a huff Staring at the wall and sitting on your duff Your eyes are puffy and your nose stuffed up Girlfriend, you're just a mess Climb 
right on up into my manger, but let me warn you about one small danger. I can't shake the stranger out of you. Prancing cream, smooth as you can, hotter than the popcorn, dancing in the pan. I have to capture a chunk of rapture with some. Be a trick in a box of cracker jack, but I can't shake the stranger out of you. You're a rockin' bronco, I must admit, stomping while your lips are chomping at the bit. I'll kiss you, but who's gonna miss you when you're chasing midnight? Glad to be your one shot pleasure, even if you grieve and have your leisure pain. I can't shake the stranger out of you. Who's got the stuff to put a saddle on you? I'm glad you higher on the fires of desire than you ever knew. All our favorite fantasies have come to an end. We'll be waking up tomorrow and needing a friend. Cause I can't shake a stranger. Wonderful. So, how about the the new material that you came up with for the Blackberry Rose album? So, I had songs in my hip pocket um, that had been sitting on scraps of paper in my desk for decades. I know Gay Bar Blues, right? Was Gay Bar Blues was originally part of the Lavender Country. Uh, series and, and we wrote it at the same time the Clara Fraser song was old and some of the other songs were new to the album so it was a compilation of stuff that had been hanging around and stuff that was newly written and you gave it the full like honky tonk outfit treatment sort of uh yeah, yeah. well I or your producer by then I was a lot more sophisticated with music So Patrick, uh, can you tell me about your relationship with your father? I know that that's a big part of your story. It is a big part of your story. I read something about uh, you. You were uh, you. You won a contest dressed as a cheerleader. Well, it's like 1950s, and it's rural America, and you can only imagine the horror of what was happening to sissy kids, especially with their dads. Right. Uh, beating, mocking, 
derisive rejection, throwing them out of the house, mm -hmm. calling them names. I missed I missed it all um, because of my dad. I was clearly a sissy. And everybody in the family knew it by the time I was like five. Um, Pat's a sissy. We have to make accommodations for this. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we're going to talk about this. It's not going to be a secret. And we're all going to work our way through this and we're going to love Patrick the sissy. That's what was going on at my house. Uh, my dad was old school. He was traditional Catholic. He was a bumpkin. He wore farmer brown overalls and was missing half of his teeth and chewed Copenhagen snuff and um, was balding and was had a, an extremely gruff exterior. My father never denigrated me, never, not one time, ever. And I was wearing ballerina outfits, and he was helping me make blonde wigs out of baling twine, and he was putting up with me running around with the girls all the time. I wouldn't ever shut up singing show tunes in the barn, and he put up with it all. And I really put him through the paces. I was a terrible farmer, really bad. <laughs> and I was a worse mechanic. And he was a machinist, and there was all kinds of farm machinery. And when I was about 10 years old, I stacked up his tractor by running it into an alder tree, blew it up. And my father was standing in the field watching the whole thing happen. Did he yell at me? No. He said to my older brothers, look, if it's got a wheel on it or any kind of other thing that goes whir, keep this kid off of it before he kills himself. That's what he did. And he was so right. And then he went to town and he went and spent his last $25 and bought me a guitar and brought it home and said, here, play this and stay off of my machinery. Wow. Yeah. Very fortuitous. Yeah. I didn't have any trouble being a sissy in 1955 in Clallam County on the farm with all these loggers' kids. All because he imbued me with that self-confidence. I was president of every damn thing I ever wanted to be president of. And I was president of a lot. Like what? Like the 4-H club, like the sophomore class president, like the senior class president, like any office I ever wanted to run for. I won. I was college bound. That was clear. Um, you know, you got to get the hell up out of this valley or you're going to starve to death. Quote, unquote, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So that meant go get a scholarship. One of the things that you do when you go get a scholarship is you run for student body office. And I was only a sophomore, and I couldn't run for student body president. If I had run for student body president, I would have fucking won. So I decided to run for head cheerleader. So I'm riding to school and at the, for the pep assembly, and I'm putting on my costume. My older brother is driving me because he had a job in town. And like he could get me there early so I could get ready to do this pep assembly. And I was putting on my costume, which was a lipstick smile about four inches wide from ear to ear. Oh, wow. And yeah. glitter all over my face. And my brother said, what the f hell are you doing? <laughs> and I'm putting on my costume. He said, I wouldn't be caught dead walking into the high school looking like that. And I said, well, you wouldn't be caught dead running for head cheerleader either, so what's the difference? Right? 
He dropped me off the high school and my glitter and lipstick smile. And he called my dad and he said, um, they're going to kill your son this morning. You got to get up to the high school. So it was about 20 minutes later and I saw my dad walking down the hall and he had his farmer brown boots on and his high top boots and there was cow crap spatters up to the knee and looked like a hick. And I, I didn't, I didn't want a hick raining on my parade. <laughs> so I ducked him. In other words, I betrayed, I betrayed this man who loved me so dearly. So we did the pep assembly and I got up and I did my little peppy pat routine and it was clear, very clear to everybody in the auditorium that I was going to win this election by a landslide, which I did. So I'm riding home with my dad after the pep assembly because it's bailing time and I was supposed to be in the field all day and he was the one that allowed me not to be in the field all day so I could go do the do that I was doing at the high school and run for head cheerleader. That part's important. He let me off of farm duties to go run for head cheerleader. And, and he said, uh, I thought I saw a kid look just like you ducking out on his dad this morning when I was walking down the hall. But I knew it wasn't you because you'd never do that to your dad. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that feel? Uh, I was squirming in my seat. Yeah. And then he looked me right in the eye and he said, I'm sure glad it wasn't you that ducked out on your own dad this morning. At this point, I'm speechless. Right. It's like he's dressing me down good. And did I have it coming or what? And... I said, Dad, did you have to wear your cow crap pants to my pep assembly? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, I'll be plumb go to hell. Here I thought this was about what you were wearing, and it turns out it was about what I was wearing. <laughs> I, I understand perfectly. Now listen up. I'm a farmer. This is what I do. I'm proud of what I do. And I don't have time to change my clothes every time you kids get your ass in a sling at school and I have to come up there. I don't have time to do that and I don't want to do it and I'm not going to do it and there's not a reason for me to do it. Because I'm not ashamed of who I am and I'm not ashamed of what I do. Now we're going to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, were you proud of yourself with that glitter all over your face and that lipstick smile from ear to ear? And I said, well, I think I'm going to win the election. And he said, I know you're going to win the election. It's not what I asked you. I asked you if you were proud of yourself. You know, I'm 15 years old. I'm emerging into my sexuality and my manhood, and I'm befuddled and confused. And and I don't know. I don't know what to. I don't know what to tell this man. And he said, uh, "You know, I'm dying," which he was, and he was going to be dead within about a year and a half. And he said, you know, I'm not going to be around when you're a grown-up to help you deal with any of this stuff. You know that, don't you? And I said, yes, I know. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you something now. And you probably won't know what it means. But you'll know what it means when you're an adult. And I want you to remember, because I'm not going to be here. Promise me you'll remember. Said, okay, I'll remember. He said... Who are you going to go out with at night when you're at the University of Washington Drama School? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. And he said, that's a damn lie. You do know. 
And it's not going to be that McLaughlin girl that I've been trying to get you to go out with, but you won't even pick up the telephone. I know it's not going to be her. Whoever you go out with at night when you get to college, don't sneak like you did today. Because if you sneak, it means you think you're doing the wrong thing. And if you spend your whole life thinking you're doing the wrong thing and sneaking, you'll ruin your immortal soul. So don't sneak, okay? We're talking about a hay field with a bumpkin and his sissy kid in 1958. Who got that? Sure as hell wasn't on TV. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It sure wasn't. It wasn't anywhere. There wasn't one sissy kid in 1958 in any hay field anywhere in America who got that. But I got it from my father who loved me. This has been a conversation with Lavender Country. Thanks to Patrick and JB for letting us record this in your living room and to Jack Moriarty and his parents for participating. Thanks also to Jack Habegger and Miles Rosati for going on location and making this whole thing happen. Once again, if you'd like to hear the unedited version of this interview, you can visit lowprofilepodcast.com. There's a Patreon link on there as well if you'd like to help cover the cost of this show that is unprofitable by its very design. That's it for Season 3. It's been a wild ride, and I've learned so much, and I hope you can say the same. Please share this episode with somebody who you think might like it. Thank you so much for listening. I love you. Low profile with Mark Lee Morrison.